Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Happy Sabbath. I'm joined by Kyle at my home today in Claycroft. Kyle, if you'd like to say an opening prayer. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time we have to bless thy sacrament. We ask thee, dear Lord, that you will look after your people and all people throughout the world that you will bring them peace and happiness, joy and love. And I say this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, so welcome everybody to Happy Sabbath. I'll just get myself so I'm in the camera as well. So, yeah, we're glad to have you today and we hope you prepared your sacrament emblem ready for our sacrament today. So we had a good meeting on Thursday night prayer meeting. Carl came down to mine. So there was me, Brant, um, Mark and Kyle as well. Prayed for a lot of people. So don't forget you can join us on a Thursday night. If you go to the church website and calendars on a Thursday, it'll have the link for you to join us on the prayer meeting. So if we get underway if you'd like to bow or kneel whatever you prefer and i will say the blessing on the bread at this time we welcome all present to christ's table we invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of jesus christ in whose name we worship the lord's supper is a sacrament a time to focus on the life death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. We bow all now. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. And if we bow and kneel on our knees again, and put up our hoods, and um, Kyle will... Say the blessing on the wine. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them that they may witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I want to talk about a couple different things I've been seeing in social media, but I want to frame it around a particular scripture. This is Doctrines of the Saints, section 3b, and it's the second half of verse 14. It says, We believe all things, we hope all things, we have endured many things, and hope to be able to endure all things. Everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and a good report, we seek after these things. I would like to talk to you about the kind of church I would like to join. I'm not a member of a church, and I'm kind of, kind of, I'm going to kind of go over why I'm not, why I'm a non-denominational Mormon. It's because 
by believing all things, by following this particular scripture, it's a universalist idea. It's an idea that, that all things have some truth in them, that we're going to seek out the good in all things. And so it's hard to join a church with creeds because if I do, then I have to focus on their exclusion or I have to fight against that exclusion. And if I'm fighting against it for me, this is just for me, I'm not telling you what to do, then I'm not believing all things. I think that there needs to be a place for people to go who aren't ready to believe all things yet. Russell Nelson, he is the president of the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said, there is no end to the adversary's deceptions. Please be prepared. Never take counsel from those who do not believe. Some people are taking this, this sentence. Never take counsel from those who do not believe, and they are just running with it. And I will admit, it, it doesn't sound very nice. You know, my father is an atheist. He, he left religion when he left the Salt Lake City Church. But I still seek his counsel as a father. He's a retired attorney, so in legal matters. And also, I still enjoy picking his brain on spiritual matters. I do go to my atheist father and ask him for advice about the fellowship. I ask him what he thinks about revelations that I've had. Why? Why would I do that? Why would I take counsel from someone that does not believe? Because he can give me a unique perspective. That doesn't mean I'm going to obey that counsel. But you know what? He's still a very smart man. And I do believe that atheists can and do have access to the Holy Spirit and to God. And so I do believe that even if my dad doesn't recognize it, he has that access too. And so I do believe that he and I can and do speak spirit to spirit. There are some atheists that are inherently very good. I call them born-again atheists. I want to hear from them. I want to look at this talk, and I don't want to be a naysayer about it. I do believe that Russell Nelson is an apostle. I do believe that how their church defines the term apostle and prophet and president, I think he fits their mold. I don't believe he's the prophet for the entire world. I don't think that there's only one prophet. I think that's kind of a, uh, I'm going to say silly idea. I understand that you need a one prophet type system when you're first getting started with things, right? So, you know, with Moses, there were other prophets. You can read the scriptures. They talk about them. But Moses was the one leading Israel. With Joseph Smith, it was the same way. But if the Lord really only wanted one prophet then we would have only had one church. He wouldn't have allowed the church to be destroyed like it was after Joseph Smith died. We can think celestial and ask people who aren't members of whatever church we belong to or whatever religion belong to, and they can make intelligent and reasonable and even holy and by the Spirit decisions and give advice the same way, through the same means. I personally, for me, I can't get behind this idea that everybody outside of this bubble is bad. I've met too many people that are good and I am I want to I want to believe all things. I want to hope all things. I want to endure many things and I want to be able to continue in enduring all things and in order to search for everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy and good report I can't live in that bubble. I, I That's just me. I just can't. I have to be able to take counsel from those that, that don't believe. I have to be able to find other people from other churches, other backgrounds, and even in this bubble, even in this background. And, and I, I want to hear their truth. I want to love them where they are. 
And and I want to shout to the rooftops the praiseworthy things. I want to go to a church where I'm welcome to ask questions because that's the church I grew up in. I remember I was in my early 20s. I had been inactive for a while and I started coming back to church and someone asked me, wait, why would you go to that church? What do you like about them? And I thought about it and I said, here's what I like. I love the fact that I can ask questions. I love the fact that they encourage me to ask questions because all of my life, even up to that point, yeah, they got really upset when I wouldn't go on a mission, but that was just some people pushing me away. Overall, I loved that I could question their church. I love the fact that there was this idea that because they had truth, that truth could be challenged. And I did challenge that truth. It's one of the reasons why I'm still a Latter-day Saint. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm not with them anymore. But I love that. And I don't see that here. I want to, but I don't. It does give some very good advice. Seek counsel from voices you can trust, from prophets, seers, and revelators, and from the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. Absolutely true. And I want to testify to you that there are so many prophets out there you can get advice from. And I'm thankful for that. And I want to bear testimony of that. But I also don't want to make this about the Salt Lake City Church. Community of Christ, they put out a statement about consensual non-monogamy. It says, the First Presidency has received questions about married priesthood members involved in consensual non-monogamous relationships, such as polyamory, polyandry, polygamy, and open marriages. Monogamy is a basic principle for marriage in community of Christ and should be upheld in all instances. Therefore, community of Christ priesthood members should not be involved in consensual non-monogamous relationships. I want to point out that this is for priesthood in their church. So if you hold priesthood keys in their church, they want you to be monogamous. And I respect that. I like the fact that they're not saying that members will be excommunicated if they practice in these things. At the same time, I am uncomfortable with being in a church that if the Lord calls someone, that church will not call them as well. With the Brighamites, you know, women, and it used to be black men in the priesthood, now it's a blanket, just women. If the Lord calls them, he has to call them out of their church to another church that will ordain them. That's unfortunate. And now it's the same thing here. They're saying if the Lord calls someone to the ministry that is not monogamous, then the Lord has to call them to a ministry outside of their organization. And I have to ask, is this idea of exclusion a part of the restoration? Well, obviously it is because we see it. But I don't believe it's what the Lord wants us to do as a restorational movement. I think it's what we as people do. In their document, they share a scripture, and that scripture is their version of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 150, verse 10. And I'm going to read verse 10a quickly. Monogamy is the basic principle on which Christian married life is built. Yet, as I said before, there are also those who are not of this fold to whom the saving grace of the gospel must go. Two things here. One, I do agree that monogamy is the basic principle that Christian marriage is built on. Because you can't become a polygamist without first being a monogamist. You can't be polyamorous if at first you aren't monogamous. Now, I myself, Christine and I, we are monogamous. I always do full disclosure here. But I want to belong to a church where if a polygamous family comes, they're welcome. And I believe the community of Christ will welcome them. Same thing with a polyamorous family or even a family who is in a consensual open relationship. I believe that community of Christ, to some extent, depending on location, I have some disclaimers there because people are people and that's life. I think that they would be welcome. 
But I have a problem here. If you keep reading, it says that the church must be willing to bear the burden of their sins as if polygamy were something wrong. They want them to repent of this so they can be free as a people from the sins of the years of their ignorance. Now, I do believe that community of Christ prophets are prophets. So what does this mean as far as it being a revelation from God? In the revelation that I received on polygamy, it says something very similar. I say unto the one man and one woman in the Lord. So it has to start with monogamy. And then together, if you read on, it says, if they as one desire to be sealed into another, be it a man or a woman, and if they be found righteous, then behold, let them be sealed by my servant as one flesh, and thus three become one. And if these as one desire to take another, it shall be as the Spirit shall move them. Now, I think that this is important to understand as far as this sin of ignorance. I see too many polygamists with this idea that they need to collect wives, that they have to get wives. And it's not just a Mormon thing. I've seen this outside of Mormonism as well, where men are just collecting women. And it isn't exactly consensual. And so I would call that a sin of ignorance. They don't understand that women and men are equal. They're supposed to be partners. And so if the family decides to enter polygamy, polyamory, whatever it is, they have to decide that together as one. Now, I am, want to attend a church with these families. And I think, like I said, I could do that at Community of Christ. But I want them to be called by the Lord to the ministry if the Lord wants them to be ministers. Which means that if the Lord calls someone who is taking advice from people who don't belong to a particular church or someone who has multiple spouses, the Lord calls them to preach, to take care of a flock, to share a message. I want to see that happen. I want to worship with them. I want to hear that. I want to be a part of that. And the sad reality is there isn't a place like that on the earth. There, there isn't a church that can do that. There's the fellowship, but we're not really a church. We don't have a building. We don't have a place we can go and my kids can meet with other kids and play and hang out. And here, here is why all this is so important to me. Satan wants to make sure that our children don't see same-sex couples, transgender people. He really just doesn't want us to see love or other people or each other as good. And so he tries to make it seem like love and people just being people is somehow not normal. And that's, as a parent, my problem. Satan wants to make a normal thing like marriage seem strange to children so that when they grow up and they see two men or two women or non-binary people married, they want it to feel odd because they've never seen it before. And that is a problem because everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and of good report, those are the things we're seeking after. How can we seek after the beauty of marriage, the beauty of commitment of same-sex couples, of multiple people in one relationship, if we shove it to the corner and hide it? I don't, I don't think we can. I want to be able to take my children to a church, to a building where everyone is welcome and everyone is seen. And that church just doesn't exist on the earth today. And so my thought for you is this. When will this restoration of some things become the restoration of all things? When will we learn to believe all things, to hope all things, and to endure? We've endured so much. 
And there's so much more to endure. When will we endure the challenge of inclusion? Brothers and sisters, I want to know, when will we as Latter-day Saints begin to seek after everything that is virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and of good report? Why not now? I pray every day that it can be now. My oldest is now 18. I didn't have a church that I could raise her and where she could see these things, these beautiful things. My youngest, he's going to church. There's not very many people there, but there's people there. And there are people there his age and there's activities and it's great. But it's not as inclusive as, as I would like to see it. I want to challenge you today to be a people of the scriptures, to be a people of the restoration, and to stop seeking ways to not make people count, not make people matter, not make people a part of things, but instead start looking at everyone to see the good in them. That's what the Lord does. And I believe that if we are true disciples of Jesus Christ, it's what we are called to do as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So that concludes our sacrament uh, official get together for this morning. Don't forget Thursday night, 7.30 in UK is prayer night for the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. With a lot of good things happening uh, there, we're hopefully going to get thanks to Brandt, who's working hard on on getting an app where we can share the scriptures online. And don't forget, there's always a home for you in um, the Fellowship of Christ or Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. If you don't feel safe where you are and you want somewhere to go, come to us. Uh, all are welcome, and uh, we would love to have you there. So if you'd like to know more, the link will be above uh, with the church website. Oh, my, see, my church email, I think he might put it below for you. So I'm going to finish up with prayer now and uh, for this week. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can remember what Jesus did for us by taking the emblems, Lord. And we ask that it will bless us for the rest of the week. Now we pray for peace in our world, especially in our England at the moment. There's a lot of uh, riots, so we pray that they see some people get together. We pray for world peace. We pray for everybody, Lord. You know everybody by their name. And by, you know every hair on our head. So we ask you to bring more people to you. Bring them to us, Lord, to our church. And we thank you for your wondrous gift to us, Jesus Christ. Say these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. May his peace be with you. Yeah, and with everybody as well. Shalom. Shalom. Shabbat. Shabbat.